Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you once again. And uh, I want to welcome you to our uh, Unlock Revelation. And uh, what night is this? This is the 11th night, I guess it is. Can you imagine you've been coming 11 nights so far? So we're, we're actually, yeah, we're almost halfway through. So uh, we're coming on that. But we, uh, those of you that are online, we'll welcome you as well. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, this evening, what we're going to look at is into the most holy of heaven. We kind of talked about it several, actually last night, we talked a little about it a little bit in the beginning, but in some of the previous lectures, we also talked about it. And so we're going to flesh that out and show uh, where that's found more clearly in the Bible. So we're looking forward to that. Then tomorrow night, Revelation 13 and an echo from the past. If you've ever wondered about Revelation 13, Revelation 13 is typically one of the most uh, intense chapters in the book of Revelation because it has a lot to say about um, a beast power and economic boycott and buy, not buying and selling and actually receiving the mark of the beast as well. We won't get into the mark of the beast tomorrow night, but we will identify the, the <clears throat> powers that are shown there. And then in Revelation, or excuse me, in number 13, that will be Sunday night, beast by sea and by land. And so we're going to go into Revelation 13 even more detail on that night. There are two beasts that are rec uh, uh, brought out there, one by sea and one by land. And so we're going to identify those and see what the Bible has to say about that. All right, well, let's go ahead. We don't have any questions tonight, so let's go ahead and get into God's word. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you for a beautiful day. Even though it was a bit rainy here today, every day, as a friend of mine used to say, uh, is a good day when you're above ground. And so we just want to thank you for that. We thank you for the gift of life in Christ that we have, that he is our Savior, and that we can uh, rely wholly and totally upon him. Lord, this evening, as we open up your word once more, we pray that you will send your Holy Spirit that you will guide us and guide those that are watching online as well, that you will illuminate our hearts and our minds to understand. We thank you for it tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to uh, the book of Daniel once more, because we're going to go to Daniel, and you'll be looking for Daniel 7. That is page 1029 in the seminar Bibles. So page 1029 in the seminar Bibles. And just mark it there. We won't go into it right away, but I um, want, want you to have it handy when we get to that point. So Daniel chapter 7. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, tonight about um, setting the stage for our study. And you're probably going to get tired of this, but because uh, I'm going to repeat myself a fair amount. I already have as I begin because I share some things that we've already gone over. But the Apostle Peter said, it is, it is good for me to tell you things again because sometimes we don't get it the first time. And, of course, if you've ever been a teacher, uh, you know how important it is to sometimes repeat it. You think they're listening, but they're not necessarily so we want to uh, remind ourselves that the sanctuary is a very central player in the book of Revelation. We've been noticing that as we've been going through, and we've seen that Jesus has been walking through the sanctuary uh, in the book of Revelation as we go from chapter to chapter. He's gone from the, the, the um, seven-branch candlestick to the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and now most recently, he's moved into the most holy place as we've been reading through the book of Revelation. And what we've said is that the sanctuary teaching basically tells us the beginning of man's salvation history and the end of man's salvation history and how God would deal with the sin problem. Now, as you recall, as we've been going through Revelation, we put up this timeline and you're going to get this filled out as a handout at the end, so you'll be able to take it home and, and take a uh, look at it a little bit more um, 
at, at length, I should say. But we found that the prophecy of the seven churches represented seven era, eras of the church history from the beginning when Jesus went back to heaven all the way down to the end, which would be the Laodicean church, which we found is where we're at right now uh, after the 1840s. And then we found that the prophecy of the seven seals actually follows that same outline pattern and talks about the same time periods, but it adds more details, as we noticed. And the seventh seal is the time of Laodicea. That's the time of the second coming. Then as we looked at the prophecy of the seven trumpets, we found, lo and behold, that it also follows that same timeline. And uh, the first trumpet corresponding with the Ephesus church, second trumpet, third trumpet, and then in the fourth, fifth, and sixth trumpet, there is a, there's a kind of a combination of time periods there, but the seventh trumpet definitely is when the Lord is coming back in the clouds of glory. And then uh, last, was it last night? I think it was, uh, the last time we were together, I should say, the prophecy of the woman with the child in Revelation 12, we saw that the child, Jesus, was born. Uh, the woman was pregnant, ready to give birth. That's back B.C. A.D. time. Then the child was caught up in 31 A.D., representing Christ. And then after that time, the prophecy said that the woman would be persecuted. And we found that this woman being persecuted actually parallels the persecution that showed up in these messages of the second and third uh trumpets and seals and, and, the, and the churches. And we saw that that woman would be persecuted and taken care of for 1,260 days. We saw as 1,260 years. So this time period of persecution actually fits quite well with the persecution we saw as we went through the seals and the trumpets and also the seven churches. And then we saw the woman was helped one of the ways that she was helped is that woman represented the true church was uh, allowed to immigrate to America, a brand new nation, or I should, I should say a, a brand new country discovered in those days where she was allowed to have religious liberty. And then after that period of time, sometime after that time when the woman was helped, the remnant is revealed in, in uh, Revelation. And that again, corresponds with Laodicea, seventh seal, seventh trumpet. So that gives you kind of an overview of what we've seen so far. We also saw that in Revelation 12, it's laid out as a chiasm, and the very center of Revelation is the victory formula for everybody that is living in those days, actually anybody that decides to be a Christian, that we overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and we're willing to sacrifice our lives for the sake of the truth. So uh, we saw that the other night as well. Then we looked at this uh, in the question that we, we um, talked about or answered at the beginning, and we saw that this, this particular prophecy of the 2300 days was just like Daniel 2 in the sense that it revealed to us the incredible accuracy and trustworthiness of our God and Savior, amen? So we found that the decree to start the process of the 2300 days, as well as the 70 weeks of the, or 490 years of the Jewish people was 100% accurate. Uh, Jerusalem was restored by 408 BC, again, 100% accurate. Then we saw that Jesus arrived right on time and was presented to Israel by John the Baptist as the Messiah in 27 AD, exactly as the yearly prophecy said that he would. Then it told us that in the middle of the week, the last week, that he would be cut off, Messiah would be cut off. So that ministry, Jesus ministered for three and a half years, and then he was crucified, he was cut, cut off, and then for another, and, and so that was exactly 100% uh, accurate. And then for another three and a half years, the, the apostles only preached to the Jews. But then when Stephen was, was stoned, they began to be persecuted and they headed out and shared the gospel with the, with the Gentiles. Now, all of these things were 100% active, or I should say accurate, 
And we can corroborate them by looking at history books and see that these things exactly happened. Now, what happened in 1844 is something that we cannot, we did not see because it said, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And we suggested that was the moment that Jesus moved into the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. Well, because of course it's in heaven, we didn't see that, nobody saw it. So we have to take it by faith, right? And so the reason that we're willing to take it as having happened is that every single one of these other predictions came out exactly true. And so it gives us confidence that if this happened, these things happened, then this also happened as well, okay? Now we saw when we were looking at Revelation that in fact, as we've gotten to Revelation 11 and 12, we see for the first time Jesus in the most holy place by the Ark of the Covenant, okay? Uh, and so that gives us encouragement that, that, that uh, it is in fact true. And so we know as according to Hebrews 9, 24, that Jesus has now appearing in the presence of God for us. So, you know, the, uh, I don't know if you know it really or not, but the word Satan means the accuser the accuser of the brethren. And so just like he accused Job, he is constantly accusing us before God. And um, we don't have the ability to defend ourselves because actually what he accuses us of, us of is true. We are sinners, but we have an advocate in heaven for us, right? Just as, just as Hebrews said, Jesus Christ, the right, righteous. And so that is good news. All right, so right after we identified the, the woman, or I should say the remnant church that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, we find, and we're going to look at this in more detail later, that in Revelation 14, this remnant group of God's people in the last days have a very special message to share. And the first angel here that shares it says, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his what? His judgment has come. So we discovered that as the high priest went into the most holy place in the old Jewish economy, that meant that it was the time of the day of atonement, or they understood it as a day of judgment. So this first angel says that his hour of judgment has come. So we see now where we're at at this point in our, in our study of Revelation is that Jesus is ministering in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. And when he moved into the most holy place, it was be the beginning of the, the antitypical day of atonement for all mankind. Now the high priest would always go in once a year in the old Jewish economy, but it was a type, it was a figure of how at, at a certain point in mankind's history, Jesus would move into the most holy place to begin to bring to an end this, this uh, issue of our salvation and taking us home. So it was known, as I said, as a day of judgment. So in reality, friends, what we're discovering here is that we are now living in the antitypical day of atonement since 1844. And the Lord is in the process of, of judging those whom he will bring to heaven or will cause to be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Now, we remember that because uh, David says in Psalm 73, verse 17, until David, of course, was looking at the wicked and he was just upset because they were getting away with murder. You know, it just seemed like uh, he was trying his best to follow the Lord, but he had lots of problems. But all the wicked seemed to get away with things. And then he said, until I went into the sanctuary of, the, of God, then I understood their end. The reason he says that is because when you study, the, as we've been studying the work in the most holy place, you realize it was a time of judgment. And we're going to see that tonight in our study. So he knew that the wicked would be judged and they would get their just due, which would be punishment. So what we're realizing here, friends, is that time is running out for mankind. I said this before, you all, I have heard it, you all have heard it, pastors preach it, um, 
teachers teach it, uh, Christian teachers teach it, that it's almost time for Jesus to come. And you ask them, well, how do we know? Well, it just seems like it. There's wars and rumors of wars. But you've been seeing here tonight and, and in these successive meetings that there is substantial proof that we are in the last days, that according to the prophecies we've been seeing, we the Lord has brought us all the way down to where the only thing left for him to do is to come in the clouds of glory. So prophecy has revealed to us that it is in fact true that we are running out, out of time. With Jesus moving into the most holy in heaven, time is running out. That was the end of the cycle for the Jewish economy in the yearly sacrifice with the, with the sanctuary. We are seeing that in Revelation, Jesus has moved there now since 1844. And so uh, we know we are very close. Now, I want to remind you of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now, all these things happened to them, to the ancient Israelites, as examples. And they were written for our admonition on whom the ends of the ages have come. So all these things that we're studying here are admonitions to us. They're, they're helping us to be ready for the second coming. Now, let me ask you a question. If you were there when Jesus came the first time, would you have accepted him as your savior? Now, that's a very a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> you know, we would all like to say, well, yes, of course I would have. But would we really? It's easy from this perspective to say, yes, I would, but you have to think for just a minute what it would have been like for somebody back then to have met somebody who said, I'm the Messiah. Just like we would feel today if somebody walked in this door and said, I'm the Messiah, you know, I've come back. We'd be a little bit skeptical, right? And so we, and so a lot of people were not prepared and eventually, in fact, listened to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and chose not to accept Jesus as their personal savior. Now, today, because we have hindsight, we can look back and we can see that he was, in fact, the Messiah. You know, the prophecies and the testimonies all prove it to us. But if we were living in that time, we would have been wrestling back and forth between what the Pharisees said, what the Sadducees said, and what we saw Jesus say, you know, and things of that nature. And uh, the sad reality is most people of the Jewish nation did not accept him as their savior the first time. So what we're looking at here, friends, tonight is that as Jesus prepares to come the second time, do you think the devil is going to try to do the same sort of number on people to keep them from being ready for him to come the second time? You bet. And so it behooves us to be prepared. It behooves us to listen to the admonitions of the past and be prepared for what's coming. Now, all right, that's all the, the review that we've talked about, so let's move on. Now, you might be asking, is there any other proof about this concept that Jesus has moved into the most holy place? We've looked at it in Revelation, and it seems reasonable. Obviously, it's, it's obvious that with seeing the Ark of the Covenant, it looks like Jesus has started going into the most holy. But is there anything else in Scripture that reveals that? So what we're going to do is we're going to find that the answer is yes, and the book of Daniel is going to help us. Now, you might recall when we looked at the mighty messenger of Revelation 10 that we noticed some extremely interesting parallels between Revelation 10 and Daniel 12. So it told us that there's a relationship between these two books. For instance, we saw that in Daniel 12, the angel told Daniel to shut up the impression that the time of the end had happened, and now it was time to open this book. Uh, in Daniel 12, there was a man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river. And then in Revelation 10, the angel or messenger stood upon the sea, upon the earth. So a similar posture, you know, standing there. And then in Revelation or Daniel 12, the angel held up his hands, both hands to heaven, to swear to the Lord in heaven. In Revelation 10, the messenger lifted up his hand, obviously just one hand because he had the book, the open book in his other hand, right? 
And then he says uh, in Daniel 12, he swore by him that liveth forever. In Revelation 10, the uh, messenger uses the same words. He swore by him who liveth forever. And then in Re Daniel 12, the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end, the angel said. And Revelation 10, uh, the angel tells Daniel to prophesy again before many people. So we saw that there's some interesting parallels between these two chapters, these two books. And what we're going to find tonight is that there are some other parallels that are going to really help us to understand. Now, when we looked at Daniel 2, we made mention that Daniel 2 is like an outline prophecy. Just like in Revelation, the, 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 the prophecy to the seven churches is an outline prophecy. It starts with a basic understanding or basic timeline of events to come. And then he adds some things. Daniel 7 will add some more details to this outline of Daniel 2 that we've already looked at. And then we'll find that Daniel 8 will add even more detail and flesh out this uh, picture that is being built through prophecy. And so we'll see this uh, constantly going on, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Daniel 8. And actually, uh, we could go on to Daniel 9, Daniel 10, Daniel 11, Daniel 12, and keep going. And it keeps adding details to the same basic outline of salvation history of mankind. We're not going to go into Daniel 9 and 10 and 11 in, in that regard here tonight or in the future. But I just want you to see that Daniel is laid out very similar to the way Revelation is. Now, in the Catholic Encyclopedia, uh, in commenting on Daniel 7, it says this. The second main part of the book in the Hebrew Bible is taken up with four visions which Daniel describes in the first person. The first of these visions in chapter 7, which we'll look at tonight, is referred to the first year of Balthasar's reign and offers a close parallel to the dream set forth and explained in the second chapter of the book. So in the Catholic Encyclopedia, they understood this relationship, that the, the, the prophecy of Daniel 2 is related to Daniel chapter 7. So it's, it's, it's uh, got some very close parallels there. It goes on, the nightly vision was of four several bees coming up out of the sea, and symbolical of the Gentile powers judged in due time by the Ancient of Days, and finally replaced by the universal and everlasting messianic kingdom. So uh, that is exactly what we're going to see tonight as we progress, is that same concept. Now, to, just to give you an overview of Daniel, you might not be surprised if I told you that Daniel is laid out in a chiastic form as well, just like Revelation is. In this instance, it's, uh, it's half of it is a chias chiasm, and the other, the last half is a chiasm. This one goes from chapter 2 to chapter 7. And just kind of look at it here. Uh, the Daniel 2 is a prophecy about the rise and fall of kingdoms. Daniel 7 is a prophecy about the rise and fall of kingdoms. They both do the same thing. Uh, Daniel 3 is a narrative of the persecution of Daniel's friends. Uh, those are the ones that were thrown into the fiery furnace. And then Daniel 6, coming back, is a narrative of the persecution of Daniel. So they both deal with persecution. And Daniel 4, it's a prophecy of the fall, <coughs> me, the fall and rise of the king of Babylon. That's the story of King Nebuchadnezzar, who became a beast for seven years and in and up accepting the Lord as his savior. But then in uh, Daniel 5, it's a prophecy of the fall and death of a king of Babylon. And that's the story of Belshazzar, or Belshazzar who uh, was not listening to history. In fact, Daniel says, you knew all these things that happened to your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. And so he refused to accept the God of, of heaven. So it's a parallel there. And it basically is a story about how uh, one man can know the truth and, and be set free. Another man can be, know the truth and he decides against it. So quite fascinating there. But let's continue now and go to the book of Daniel. And we'll look at Daniel 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream 
and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. So as we begin chapter 7, God is in the process of giving Daniel a dream. And in the dream, he sees this incredible uh, story, you might say, or outline of prophecy to come, things to come, that he writes down for us to be able to read later on. So most of these verses I'm going to put on the screen so you can follow them in your Bible or on the screen, either one. Uh, but we go to the screen and in Daniel 2, it says, Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Now, I, I just want to pause for a minute and say the reason we're going to Daniel 7 is because we're going to see that what we've been talking about in Revelation, about Jesus moving into the most holy place, is also seen in Daniel 7. Okay, So we're going to see a parallel here and further proof that this is not something that Pastor Stewart has just come up with uh, in the book of Revelation. Okay, All right, so he sees four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. So what do these symbols mean? All right, if we look at up four winds, we want to look up four winds. What are the four winds and what's the great sea? All right. In Jeremiah 49, 36 through 37, we're letting the Bible describe or, de or define for us these symbols. He says, God says, against Elam, I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcast of Elam will not go. So what are these winds doing? Goes on, for I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them. So these four winds are bringing disaster, obviously conflict, right? My fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. So we're seeing here the, the four winds are bringing a conflict and disaster here, uh, according to what, the, what Jeremiah says. And then in Revelation 17, verse 15, when we wanted to identify the great sea in Daniel chapter 7, what is the sea? And the angel said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So the great sea of humanity, we looked at that before. There's also a place in Isaiah 17, verse 12, that tells us the same thing. Woe to the multitude of many people who make a noise like the roar of what? The seas. And to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. And so you see the Bible is giving us an explanation of what waters or seas represent. It's a, it's a sea of humanity. So the, the translation would be that God is allowing calamity from the four winds, from the four quarters of the, of the compass to come upon the great sea of humanity. And out of that are going to come uh, the next, the next uh, entities that are revealed in the, in the scripture. Verse 3 of Daniel 7. And four great beasts came up from the sea, sea of humanity, each different from the other. Daniel, we're, uh, and, and by the way, uh, we want to ask the question, what are beasts, right? We, I think we talked about that the other day, but again, Daniel or the Bible will tell us what those beasts represent. Daniel 7, verse 17 through 23, those great beasts, an angel is giving Daniel the interpretation, which are four, are four kings, which are arise out of the east. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. So according to the Bible, what does a beast represent? Represents a king or a kingdom. Okay. So it's very clear that as he sees these beasts coming up out of the sea of humanity, he's talking about a kingdom arising up out of the sea of humanity. All right. Let's continue. Verse four. The first, the first beast was like a what? Like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off. <clears throat> now, again, as I mentioned before, we want to find out what these symbols mean in Babylon, or I should say in Bible time, not what they mean today, because they didn't know those symbols then. 
But what does the Bible say about these symbols? So uh, Jeremiah 4 verse 7 tells us, Jeremiah lived many, many years before this. Uh, the lion has come up from his thicket and the destroyer of nations is on his way. This is, by the way, is a example of Hebrew parallel poetry. The Bible is actually very poetic in a lot of ways. I think you've noticed that in Psalms especially. But it says it once, and then it says it a second time in a little bit different way. So it's talking about the same thing. The lion has come up from his thicket. What, who is the lion? The destroyer of nations is on his way. So the lion is the destroyer of nations. Now, who is that destroyer of nations? It happened to be Babylon. In the context of Jeremiah there, it was talking about Babylon. Now, we know that the symbol of the lion with wings is a very fitting one for Babylon because in, the, in a number of, of um, museums in the world, they have some of the re reliefs from the rubble, the, uh, the ruins of Babylon, and they show winged lions. Now, the wings here are folded against the side. It's the brown. You can't really see it very well in this one, but this one shows it quite well. So this was a very common relief on the side of the walls of Babylon. So that was their motif, or that was their, you might say, their um, national uh, beast, if you will, the winged lion. So we know that the lion then represents Babylon. Well, lo and behold, we remember that Daniel 2 started off with a head of gold, which rep represented what? Babylon. So if it's an outline prophecy, we should assume that chapter or yeah, chapter seven prophecy is going to start with Babylon as well. But it reveals it as a winged lion this time. And we see why, because it is uh, called that in the Bible. And so Babylon is the head of gold, the winged lion um, conquered or, or, or ruled, I should say, from 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. So we see this paralleling us there. Then verse five, the next beast comes and suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. OK, so we're going to identify what this bear is in just a second and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, arise, devour much flesh. So let's see what the Bible says about this second beast, shall we? Isaiah 13, verse 17 through 19 says, Behold, and by the way, Isaiah was hundreds of years before this prophecy was given. God predicted, I will stir up the Medes against them. In the context, it's against Babylon. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. So God predicted in, in Isaiah hundreds of years beforehand that he would lift up the Medes and the Persians to conquer Babylon. So we can see then that it would make sense that this next beast, this bear, would represent the Medo-Persian Empire. In Jeremiah 51, verse 11, he says, Sharpen the arrows, fill the quivers. The Lord has aroused the spirit of the kings of the Medes because his purpose is against Babylon to destroy it. For it is the vengeance of the Lord, vengeance for his temple. Now, I don't know that people were on top of it enough to realize that they had history in advance, you know, in those days. Because when Jeremiah was giving this, Babylon was at its peak. Nobody could conquer Babylon. In fact, Babylon was just in the process of conquering Judah. And yet here he's predicting that the Medes are going to conquer Babylon. So, you know, that's a, that's a pretty amazing prophecy in, at the height of Babylon's pro, uh, power. Now, here's a map uh, that shows us a little bit th of this. The Medo-Persian, it was a dual empire, and they were over off to the east of uh, Babylon. Now, it's said that the bear would be raised up on one side. Do you remember that? Well, it was a dual empire. The Medes were on top first. In other words, they were the power to begin with. The Persians were the lesser. They just formed a pact together. But gradually, as the years went on, the Persians overtook the Medes, and the Persians became the, the main uh, empire. And, of course, we all know about the Persian Empire, right? 
uh, and, and all that they did. And so they came in from a mountainous era, area over on the east side. This area is known for its mountains. And typically bears are pretty common in mountains. But down here in Babylon, it's mostly uh, more or less flatter land. And they had a lot of the lions, the Asian lions there. Now it says that the bear had three ribs in its mouth. In order for Medo-Persia to conquer Babylon and uh, the, the, the nin, then known world in that area, it had to conquer Babylon, it had to conquer Lydia up here, and then it had to conquer Egypt. Those are the three ribs. And that's exactly what they did. History tells us that the Medo-Persians overcame Babylon, then they took Lydia, and then they conquered Egypt. And that became their territory at that time. So Persia represents the chest and arms of silver of Daniel 2, and it ruled from 539 to 331 BC, uh, just as we saw in the statue of Daniel. We continue in Daniel 7, verse 6. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. Now, the lion had two wings, and wings oftentimes repre represent speed, you know, as far as the ability to conquer fast. But if two was fast, how many would four represent? Really fast, right? So this was a conquering uh, entity that really uh, took on the world in a, in a storm. The beast also had four heads. So now they're getting a little bit weirder here. Had four heads and dominion was given to it. So as we look at this, we ask ourselves the question, what do, what do the wings represent? Uh, Psalms 18 verse 10 says, And he rode on cherubim, speaking of God, and did fly. Yes, and he did fly on the wings of the wind. So if you're flying on the wings of the wind, uh, nothing is impeding you. Right, You're moving forward very rapidly on the wings of the wind. And that is exactly what this power did when it came into uh, the kingdom. This represents Greece, the thighs of bronze. It ruled from 331 to 168 BC. You know, we often talk about the Germans as being the the uh, creators of the blitzkrieg warfare, right? In other words, lightning warfare, and they did. But Alexander the Great was really the first because he conquered the then known world in an incredibly short period of time. It was just amazing how fast that he was able to overcome all those entities. Now, what about these, these four heads? What has that got to do with it? Well, uh, Alexander had four main generals. He had Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. And typically what would happen when a conqueror was going to, to uh, bequeath his kingdom or his, his empire to somebody else, he bequeathed it to his sons, right, or his daughters. Well, Alexander didn't have any um, uh, sons or daughters to bequeath it to. And so he died in a drunken stupor in Babylon after he came back from conquering all his, his conquests. And his generals asked him, who was he giving the empire to? And he said, he who is the strongest will rule. And so you know what that did? It set up a contest between all of them. And so they began to fight among themselves to decide who was going to overcome. Well, Seleucus took over the major part of it in, in the eastern side. Ptolemy took over the Egyptian. Lysimachus was in Asia Minor and Cassander was in Macedonia and Greece. And eventually Seleucus took over Lysimachus and uh, Cassander. So that's the four heads because the Grecian Empire continued after Alexander, but it was fractured. And just as the scripture said it would. Verse 7 of Daniel 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, a dreadful and terrible and exceedingly strong. So Daniel's not even able to describe this beast. He just says it's, it's uh, dreadful and terrible and exceedingly strong. But he does in the next verse give us an indication that can kind of link us with something here. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. Now, when we look at the, the statue of Daniel, 
We come down from Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. What's the next one there? It's Rome. And what kind of metal was it there? Iron. So there's a clue that gives us a connection with history that this is, in fact, the Roman Empire. And Rome was known for its brutality. Rome was known for giving no quarter to its enemies. It was very violent, very, very dreadful in that way. And so this is a picture of, of the Roman Empire at the time, uh, at 1, 117 AD or so at its height. And, but then the, the dream continues in verse 7. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now what was different about Rome is that Rome actually, when it started, was a republic. I don't know if you know that. They had a senate, and they voted on things. And so when they first started, that's the way they were. That was totally unheard of in the ancient world. They had kings, or they had queens, or they had emperors, right? People like that. That's the way it was with the Medes and the Persians. That's the way it was with Babylon and the Parthians and on down the line. But Rome was different. Now, eventually they did have an emperor. We know that, of course, with Caesar, but they didn't start out that way. So that's what the Bible is saying here when it says that it was different. Now, it also says that it has 10 horns. Well, this is telling us a little bit more about the history of Rome. Now, what we're, what we're seeing here, friends, is that as we progress through these beasts, the coming up of these kingdoms, we're walking through time here, right? Each of them successively, and we're seeing the, the next one pop up. Now we see Rome conquer Greece and take over its territory. But now with the ten horns, it's moving us on, and it's telling us something about this dreadful beast and what's going to happen to it. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 24, it says the ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. So we don't have to guess about what the horns are. The horns coming out of this dreadful beast are ten kings. Now that might ring a bell to you because we talked about that in an earlier lecture. In verse, uh, we'll, and we'll identify them more clearly in just a second. In Daniel 7, verse 8, Daniel says, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them. So what we're seeing here is the Roman Empire, as it progresses through its history, there's going to be ten kings that are going to sprout up in their midst as a part of the, the Roman Empire. But then it says there's going to be a little one also that will come up in their midst as well. Are you, are you tracking with it so far? Okay. All right. Historically, this is very accurate because, in fact, when we look at a map of, of um, the Roman Empire, as it began to crumble, you might remember your history that Rome was not conquered by another big empire. It was taken apart by these Germanic tribes that came down from the north and the east, and they were called the Anglo-Saxons, the Franks, the Alemanni, the Lombards, the Ostrogoths, the Burgundians, the Heruli, the, uh, the Visigoths, the Suevis, and the Vandals. And there were 10 of them that began to attack Rome as she got weaker and weaker and began to take apart the kingdom. Now, they didn't want to totally destroy Rome because Rome was a mighty power. There was a lot of prestige to say that you were part of the Roman Empire. And so they tried to keep it together to a certain degree. But nonetheless, history tells us that this is exactly what happened. And as we learned in an earlier lecture, these, these, um, these nations, or I should say these tribes, became the nations of Europe, right? All right, let's go on, verse 8, because it continues. Before whom, in other words, before the little horn power, right, that's in the midst of these ten, three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. Now, I know some of you are gardeners. If you pluck something out by the roots, what does it do to it? It dies, right? So this is the imagery that it's giving us here. So evidently, three of these tribes or these, these horns are going to be plucked up for some reason. They're going to be destroyed. And they're going to be destroyed for, for because of the, 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 some kind of connection with the little horn power that's coming up. Okay, Before whom it says, before the little horn, 
Three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. Now, as we look at these 10 tribes on a, on a different map here, we find out historically that the Ostrogoths were destroyed. There is no longer any descendants of the Ostrogoths. There also are no longer any descendants of the Vandals as a tribe. Now, I think there are in a sense because every city, every country has a lot of Vandals, right? <laughs> in, in that sense. But the tribal entity of the Vandals is no longer in existence because they were destroyed militarily. And then the Heruli were also destroyed. So again, looking at history, we find that's exactly what happened. Of these 10 tribes that, that parted up the Roman Empire, three of them were totally destroyed and wiped out. All right, verse 8 continues. Isn't this an amazing dream? You ever had a dream like this? <laughs> Not at all, but this is an amazing dream that God has given Daniel. And there in this horn, the little horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. Now, I want you to notice in what we've been talking about in the last few minutes here, Notice that there's a lot more detail that's added to this outline prophecy of Daniel 2, right? You see the principle here. It's going along the same line of Babylon, Medo-Persia, uh, Greece, Rome, and now we're adding Rome is divided into 10, and now there's a little horn coming up. So it's adding these details now, all right? Now, incidentally, this is not uncommon. I remember studying uh, American Indians, and do you know the way that they would teach their their children, their, their own history and their traditions, is that they would teach them orally and they would tell them the same story over and over again. They didn't have any writing, so they couldn't tell them, go read a book. So they would tell them over and over again, and the next time they would add some more details, you see? So it's the same principle that uh, God is using here with Daniel. So this, this little horn, this power, represents a king or a kingdom, their eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. It seems to indicate there is a singular figure that stands out in this particular power. All right, so let's look at it again. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then divided Rome. And now we see this divided by 10. By the way, the 10 horns uh, very, very easily reflect the 10 toes of the statue of Daniel 2, right? So you see the parallel there. All right, let's continue. So let's take a look at this on a timeline. The winged lion, Babylon from 603 to 539 BC. The bear, Medo-Persia, 538, 539 to 331 BC. Then we have the leopard, Greece from 331 BC to 168 BC. And then we have that terrible beast that we've identified as the Roman Empire that starts in 168 and moves on, but it doesn't say exactly how it moves on just yet here, except that there's 10, 10, uh, 10 kings that, that break it up. And then, of course, we see the 10 horns and then the little horn coming up among them. All right. So then we see as we move on, because we ran out of room on that timeline, we see the terrible beast Rome, and then the little horn begins to reign here. All right, let's, uh, let's continue here, because we've come down to verse 8, and we're going to skip verses 9 through 14, and we're going to come back to that later, uh, t t t tonight. But let's move down to verse 15. And let's read it from our Bibles. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. And, you know, I, I wrote in my Bible here, amen. If I had had a dream like that, I think I would have been pretty troubled, too. I'm thinking, what did I eat tonight that caused that, right? But it wasn't, of course, that. It was a dream that God had given him. But this was an amazing dream. And verse 16, I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. So right in the prophecy, friends, we get the interpretation. Verse 17, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings, or the margin says kingdoms which shall arise out of the earth. 
but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and even forever and ever. So the, the angel just tells him that part, then says what the end's going to be. You know, it'll c- c- turn out okay. But then Daniel says in verse 19, then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet, and about the ten horns that were on its head, and about the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, and whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. So now Daniel adds a, adds a little bit more. He says he, he knows that that little horn power was also making war against the saints, okay? And he was prevailing against them. And then until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So Daniel just kind of gives a rehearsal of what he's asking the angel there. He wants some clarification of this because he really doesn't understand it very well. So the angel summarizes the vision and he ends with what? In verse 22, uh, actually Daniel is speaking here, until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints. So he ends with a judgment, doesn't he? Right. So what time, what, what, what's going on here? Uh, the angel then complete, completes his, his explanation in verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from the all other kingdoms. Like I said, Rome was a republic initially. It shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. So these ten kings are going to come out of the Roman Empire. That's exactly what happened. These Germanic tribes came, tribes came down and they each vied for being the next uh, Roman emperor. Uh, each of these tribes at one point or another, they proclaimed themselves emperor of Rome. And so they kind of took over Rome as it disintegrated. But then it goes on to say, and another, that's the little horn, shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and he shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and he shall think to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. So how long is that time, time, and half a time? So, so let's take a look at this here on the, uh, on the screen. In our, our timeline here, we have this little horn coming up out among the ten horns, and he's going to rule for a certain amount of time, time, times, and half a times. Now, the other night, I believe I, I, I gave you a definition of that of 1,260 years. But we're going to go through that here step by step as we, as we look at it. So at some point, it's going to last for 1,260 years, and then there's going to be a judgment period for this little horn power. All right, so a time, if you look it up in the Hebrew, it can represent one year, okay? Two times the plural represents two years. A half a time is a half a year. And then so it equals three and a half times. Three and a half times equals three and a half years. So for a Jewish year, there were 360 days in a year. So three and a half times 360 ends up being 1,260 days or years. So this power, this little horn power, would persecute this church and be and prevail upon it for 1,260 years. Now, it's interesting that this particular time is shared seven different times in the book of Daniel and Revelation. Daniel 7, Daniel 12, Revelation 12, Revelation 13, Revelation 11 twice, Revelation 12 again. It's called the time and times and half a time, 42 months, 
1260 days, 42 months is, comes out to, uh, 1260 days once again, you know, 30 days in a, in a month. So you see this repeated over and over again in the Bible. So it's a very common thing. And it's referring to a time of the tribulation. Remember we talked about that? There would be a tribulation upon God's people for 1260 years. Now, Daniel says in Daniel 2, verse 35 and 34, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And in the days of these kings, uh, the kings that would come up and, and take over the old Roman Empire, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and shall not be left to other people, and it shall stand forever. What revelation? Or what Daniel 2 is saying is exactly what we're reading here in Daniel 7, that eventually that would be uh, overcome. Now, notice here, as we continue in verse 26, of Daniel 7. But the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion, the little horn's dominion. So there's a courtroom scene here. There is a judgment scene here. Then the kingdom and the dominion, the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the most high. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And the dominion shall serve, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. So what we're looking at is exactly what Daniel 2 said would happen in the very end when the stone would come and strike the image on its feet. And God's kingdom would take over the whole world. That's exactly what God is saying to Daniel in Daniel chapter 7 of these verses. So it ends, though, with a judgment just before that stone come. Now, let's go back now and pick up the verses that we left out in Daniel 7 verse 8 okay so let's take a look at that verse verse 8 and 9 and we'll continue with that I was considering the horns uh, kind of a repeat here and there was another horn a little one coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words now, from this point, uh, there's an earthly experience here that Daniel's seen. He's seen these events take place on earth. But then in verse 9, it transitioned to what he sees in heaven. He says, I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. Who do you believe the Ancient of Days is? Or God the Father, you know, in this instance, God the Father. And we'll see it is in just a second. So the Ancient of Days is in heaven. His garment was white as snow. The hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Its wheels a burning fire. In Ezekiel chapter 1, it talks about the throne of God having wheels in it. So that's this is what we're seeing here. God is seated on his throne. Verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Now watch this. The court was seated and what? The books were opened. So this is a judgment scene that Daniel sees here. He sees it after he talks about this little horn speaking pompous and blasphemous words to, to him. Uh, to, toward the Lord. And then it goes on in verse 11 says, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words, which were, the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. So after we see this judgment scene, we see the, uh, we, we see the, the judgment, you might say, the execution of a judgment upon this beast power that's blaspheming. So it's a fascinating thing. Uh, Daniel sees the, the Lord God, the, the, the Father upon his throne, and he sees him there in, in uh, verse 10 that all books are open. You know, Revelation talks about the book of life, the book of remembrance. And so God has a recording uh, ability to where he writes down the things that happen. And he has a book of remembrance where those of us that have accepted him as a personal savior, it's stamped with the blood of Christ that we've been forgiven. But there's also books where it tells about the uh, deeds of the wicked 
who have not been forgiven, who, who have not accepted Christ as their Savior. And they are open. And so then it goes on in verse 13, and it says, I was watching. Again, he's up in heaven. Daniel is watching this in heaven. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. Well, that sounds like it's the second coming, doesn't it? But wait a minute, where is he going with the, on these clouds? He says, one like the Son of Man, that has to be Jesus, right? The Son of Man, that was one of his favorite terms. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Where did we decide that the Ancient of Days was? He was in heaven, right, on his throne. And so this is a picture of Jesus, the Son of Man, coming on the clouds of heaven to his Father, right? Now, friends, this is where we get the connection with Revelation and the moving into the most holy place. Because according to the, the, uh, the sanctuary service, where was the throne of God? Where was the presence of God? It was between the cherubim, right? And the Ark of the Covenant. That's where his Shekinah glory uh, was revealed. So this in Daniel is a picture of Jesus moving into the most holy place at a certain point in time. And as we saw in the, in the prophecy of the 2300 days, those days ended in 1844. And that's when Jesus moved on the clouds of heaven into the presence of the Ancient of Days of the Most Holy. So we see it co collaborating, uh, corroborating what we have already seen in, in uh, the book of Revelation. Then it goes on in verse 14 and says, Then to him, uh, in other words, the, the uh, Son of Man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. And his dominion was an everlasting dominion which shall never pass away. And his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. So sometime after Jesus moves into the presence of the Ancient of Days into the Most Holy, it says that he would be given the kingdom. And that means that he would come back and claim the kingdom of earth as his own. So friends, again, we're living on borrowed time. We're very close to the second coming. And so Jesus is there in the most holy place in heaven right now for you and I ministering for us before the Ancient of Days, his Father and our Father. You see, as, we, as we're as we looking at this, friends, we, I, I talked about it the other day, it's kind of like a puzzle. When you first start out, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but as you continue to put the pieces together, you begin to get a picture. A picture rolls out. We see now that there is an entity called this Little Horn Power, and he's persecuting the saints of the Most High. Revelation 11, verse 19, reminds us, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. It is there that God's presence is, the Father's presence is. It is there in the ark that the Ten Commandments are there. And the wise man in Ecclesiastes 12 tells us that, Let us hear the conclusion of the, man, of the matter, uh, that we should keep the commandments of God. And so we are going to be judged by those things that show whether we're saved or lost, if we've accepted Jesus as our personal Savior or if we've rejected him. Revelation 12, verse 17, immediately after we see this picture of the Ark of the Covenant, now for the first time in Revelation, we see the commandments mentioned. Here's the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. God always sends a message to prepare his people for major worldwide events which affect their eternal destiny. We talked about that the other night. And we're going to learn that God has a very special message that his remnant needs to share in preparing people for the second coming of Jesus. Revelation 14, verse 6 is, is the first angel of this message. We're not going to look at it in full detail tonight, but I just want to give you a, a sampling of it. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. You see, the remnant church that is identified as the last day church, 
must have the gospel of Jesus Christ that they're preaching. It cannot be anything else. It must be the everlasting gospel, the one that was in existence from the very beginning when we needed a savior. To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. It's to go to everyone. Remember, we looked about how God said, or Jesus said, that he has many people that are not of this flock. I need to bring them in. This gospel is to go to every man, woman, and child, no matter where they live on planet Earth. The angel continues in verse 7. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his what? His judgment has come. Friends, this is powerful because right after you see the Ark of the Covenant in chapter 11, and then in chapter 12, you see the commandments of God. Now you see the concept of judgment. Why? Because Jesus has moved into the most holy place where the day of atonement for all mankind takes place. That is a day of judgment. And so now it says, the angel says, the hour of his judgment has come. It's happened. We are living in that time right now. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Friends, was there ever a time in earth's history that we need to call people back to worshiping God? I mean, you know, we we in America, we talk about being a Christian nation, but we look out at some of the things that are happening, and it certainly doesn't seem that way. It certainly seems that we've gone way far away from worshiping the God of heaven. Amen. And the world, especially Europe, is way behind that. That They are not worshiping God at all. There is less and less of that. And so this angel is calling people back to the everlasting gospel and to worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of the water. So we're looking at this time period after 1844 when Jesus moved into the most holy. And we're looking at this, this incredible picture that where we are at in the stream of history is not down here in Christ's day. We're not here in the uh, five five hundreds. We are clear down here in the after 1840s in the remnant, the seventh trumpet, the seventh seal and the church of Laodicea. That's where we are on this timeline. It is where we're at in the stream of history. Second Corinthians five, verse 10. Paul clearly tells us for we must all appear where? before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Listen to me, friends. I know there are some people that say that once you accept Christ, you don't have to worry about the judgment. And that's true. That's true. But there is a judgment being taken that is taking place to decide if you're genuine or not. Do you believe that everybody that says they're a Christian is genuine? No. That's why Jesus said that many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do many wonders in your name? And Jesus will say what? I never knew you. So at some point, heaven has to have a a judgment time where they decide and they make it clear who's really a Christian and who's not. Because when he comes back, Revelation 22 says, my reward is with me. If his reward is with him when he comes back in the clouds of glory, when will he have had to make a decision? Before he comes back, right? Because that's when he decides who's really a Christian and who's not. And so we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ at some point. Joshua, when he was was um, about to die, said in Joshua 24, verse, 7, verse 15, said, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the decision you and I have to make every day. You see, friends, as we look at the, the, trans, the, the, the moving of Jesus from the holy place into the most holy place, we recognize that we are in the final acts of mankind's salvation history. That is what Revelation is teaching us here. As we have moved from chapter 12, chapter 11, or chapter 10, I should say, where we were still in the holy place, 
But now in chapter 11, chapter 12, we are now in the most holy place. We see that we're on borrowed time. We see that we're getting closer and closer to the second coming. How many of you want to be ready for that coming? I do myself. Father in heaven, Lord, as we look at this evidence tonight, in the sister book of prophecy of Daniel, we have seen that the things that we're seeing in Revelation, we also see in the book of Daniel. We've seen how Daniel has this vision of these, these kingdoms coming up, and we see how there would be a persecuting power, but he also says that that persecuting power would be judged someday. And he looks into heaven and he sees the Ancient of Days there in heaven. But he also sees the Son of Man coming to the Ancient of Days, coming into the most holy place where the Shekinah glory is, where the two angels are by his side. And we see clearly that Daniel solidifies the fact that Jesus has, in fact, moved into the most holy place. Father, help us to be ready when you come in the clouds of glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, tonight I put a slide on there to, to end up with because as we go into Revelation chapter 13 tomorrow, we're going to see some fascinating parallels once again because in, in Daniel's little horn, uh, we saw all these. We saw the lion, the bear, the leopard, the terrible Iron teeth, the ten horns, speaks great things, reigns 1260 years, changes times and laws. But in Revelation 13, we're going to see exactly the same sort of things. It's an incredible parallel. We'll see a lion, we'll see a bear, we'll see a leopard, we'll see a dragon. Seems like a terrible beast. We'll see ten horns, we'll see someone that speaks blasphemies. We'll also see that they reign 42 months or 1260 years. So stay tuned for tomorrow night as we go into that and we identify that, that particular entity. God bless you as you go home. Stay safe as you drive and we'll see you tomorrow night.